So obviously, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people out there are not able to, to sit down and have one-on-one -on -one sessions with you, uh, which would be great if they could, uh, strongly, strongly advise that they could. <laughs> <laughs> if possible, do so. Um, but you went off and wrote a book. So, do you want to tell us? Uh, do you want to tell us about your book and sort of, you know, the value or, or the, the the audience, the target, the purpose, why you wrote it, where it comes from? Sure. So, so the book you're referring to is Game Changer Protocol, and that was a book I wrote mostly for myself in 2015, 2016, that kind of period of time where uh, working in high performance sport, I often work with high profile teams and there's press and there's articles and there's blogs and there's social media stuff and, and it's all quite nice and you feel like a bit of a champion and a hero when things are going well, but when things are going badly, as was the case in that year, I had like probably the worst professional year for a while. There's been some interesting ones over time, but that was a really tough year and I felt like an absolute failure because my team had failed. I felt like a loser because we had lost. And uh, I remember lying on the couch pretty miserable with myself and my wife said to me, like, Tim, if, if sport's so great and it's supposed to make you so happy, why are you so miserable? Yeah. And I'm like, <clears throat> please be more supportive, ask me better questions. Yeah. But she was bang on the money. Uh, unfortunately, as much as irritating as it was to hear it, it was still the truth. Um, yeah. Truth is often irritating like that. It's right? very irritating. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we don't so, really want people to be honest with us. Uh, we, we, like, we like it in principle until the reality hits us in a, some way. Hits us some way. And uh, so it was a good question. And, and I had to decide whether I want to leave sport or change this thing because how did I attach my value in spite of spending many hours in therapy, many hours in coaching, many hours in personal development and probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of hours over my career. How come I still hadn't solved this thing and, and kind of find a way to not have that. And so I looked at the literature and literature is pretty poor in this area of when we attach things to the outside when we are externally validated by things, objects, achievements, or reputations or statuses or, so I am someone because of the look I have. Uh, you know, I think the whole beauty industry is, is linked to that perception that value is often linked to looks. I think for a long time, people have got value for being the smartest, and especially I think of your readers and listeners who would have been validated for being great at numbers or great at accountancy or great at something. You tend to be pretty smart to walk this journey that, that you're guiding people on. And so now, if I get value from being smart, what happens if I'm not so smart? What if someone challenges my opinion or disagrees or I'm found to be wrong? Yeah. Then it can feel like you know your value has been taken away from you because at some psychological level, that's exactly what's happening. So my value was taken away from me because I, I let it happen. I attached it to results. And so now I need to figure out a way to internalize that value. So how can I feel valuable even if we lost? How can I be valuable even if you disagree with me, even if you criticize me, even if I was in the press for being an idiot, even if I got fired, even if I got fat or whatever the if was? How did I take out the ifs? Yes. Um, and so the literature was poor. It was things like, you know, be kind to yourself, uh, meditate, be grateful, show appreciation, don't compare yourself to others. Don't complain. Um, and those kinds of things are all true. But man, when you're in a down, downward spiral, who cares what those little cutesy, rootsy little sayings have to say because they just don't bloody work. They just start. I so agree. <laughs> trying to, to, you've got a shotgun, shotgun wound all over you and you get taking a little incy wincy band aid and saying, oh, that should help. Yeah. Here's the motivational poster. I feel better. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, bleep, yeah. Bleep, bleep, bleep. so I'm uh, really irritated by that and really thought that, you know, for a bunch of clever people solving like a life problem, surely there should be some better stuff. So I started asking the question, if there was a solution, what might that look like? And eventually Brene Brown was like the start of the journey where I'm a big fan of her work and I'm a big mm. fan of her as a person. And, and she spoke about in this wonderful um, TED talk called the, the Power of Vulnerability, how people who are wholehearted embrace their vulnerability and they feel like those moments are the key moments in their life and, and, and people who don't have the wholeheartedness run away from vulnerability, run away from being seen, run away from risking themselves emotionally. And, and the difference between people who live wholeheartedly who really thought vulnerability was one of the best things in their world and their life and people who 
ran away from it, protect themselves as much as they could, was that they believed, the whole heart group, that they believed they were enough and they believed they were worthy of love, connection and belonging. And I thought, I remember watching, I'm like, Phew, that's a hell of a thing to say. And I asked myself the question, do I believe I'm enough? Mm. And do I believe I'm worthy of love, connection, belonging? And at that stage of my life, the answer was no and no. And now, yeah, obviously it makes sense that I would like to have those things. I'd like to have those beliefs. And, and, but it's not enough to like to want to, you know, it's not enough to want it. You've got to find a way to do it. You've got to find yeah. a way to shift mindsets. And so fortunately for my performance background, I knew a few things on how to do that. And I had some ideas of, of how to really take it forward. So I developed a process called scanning, which is basically how to internalize those beliefs. So I'm enough. If, if your whole mind believed that you were enough, if it was an unconditional belief that you had no conditions of I'm enough when I get the project in time, I'm enough because of my status, yeah. I'm account yeah. because of my role, my title, my bank account, my whatever, my kids, my kids' yeah. achievement, that's awesome. Another area people struggle with. Um, then what do they be like? And so I found that once I developed the scanning process, I could help me internalize those two beliefs and I started looking with the others. And eventually I found there were 10 specific beliefs that contributed and, and combined to create Brene Brown's wholeheartedness. Things like I belong, things like I accept myself fully, I matter, I have what it takes. Those kind of beliefs. And, and so I found that once I understood them and started working through them and kind of upgrading them and releasing the old rubbish thinking, I started hearing how often other people had those kinds of challenges. I'm like, oh, maybe it's not just me. It was almost invisible to me until I saw the structure of it. Yes, yeah. And then it's almost like I couldn't stop hearing it. It's like, you know, yeah. I couldn't get the funny yeah. bad song out of my head. <laughs> Everyone leaked out. You know, people said, I've got a confidence issue. Now, I asked questions about confidence that turned out to be a belief issue. Mm. And on and on we went. So <clears throat> the book is the, the story of how I came to figure that out what are the specific beliefs and what's the definitions of those beliefs and how do you scan to internalize those beliefs so that you can live wholeheartedly? So one of the things that I really like about, and I really liked about our sessions, because I'm not a fan of the motivational posters, you know, they're, they're pretty and they're cute and all that, but in the moment where you're struggling, the motivational poster is not helpful. You know, the, the little boat sailing off into the distance going, you know, your future awaits, like, I'm going to burn you. <laughs> so you, you, motivational sessions are great in the moment where someone makes you feel better about yourself, uh, yeah. feel better about the situation. And in a lot of cases, it really helps just to be able to talk, you know, just to be able to get that stuff out, which again, I, you know, that, that has value and it is good and all the rest of that. But what I really, you know, what I really liked about our sessions and what I really like about the way that you work is that you provide and you give practical tools um, to go back and work on. You know, you're struggling with this. He has a process. He has advice. He has practical stuff that you can do after our session and, you know, while things are still okay so that you can think about how to approach something like that the next time it happens. You know, uh, the next time that somebody criticizes you, instead of freaking out and, you know, mentally going into, you know, a little, a little gray spin, uh, how are you actually going to deal with it? And again, what I, you know, what I want to clarify and what I, is that that same level of practicality comes through in your book, you know, that your, your book is, uh, there are practical processes, you know, yeah, step one, <laughs> yeah, step two, yeah, step three. And I, I, I want to say that because a lot of the books that you read are, very much around he has the issue, he has the challenge, and you know, go forth and conquer. Yeah. Now that you feel better about yourself, go forth and conquer. And I think the missing part for me is generally great, what do I do tomorrow? You know, what little thing can I do tomorrow? Don't tell me that I have to be different. I know that I want to be different, but I I don't know how to get from my state that's a little bit of a mess right now, uh, to to being different, you know, if it was that simple, then, you know, anybody could do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sitting in this position. It's actually only one tool. The whole, yes. the whole book's based around yeah. one tool that you use 10 or 13 different times with only minor variations because that's the easiest way to learn. So that's one of my beliefs is that it must be as simple as it can, but obviously no simpler than that. I think Einstein said that. 
um, but it must be steps and stages. So the metaphor for me is like a, a gauge in the head. So if, if our gauge is over there saying, I don't believe I'm enough, I don't believe I'm good enough, I don't believe I belong or whatever the thing is, what literature and YouTube says is go over there. You yeah. must be good. You, you yeah, know, yeah. come on. Be come positive, on. yeah. If you just want to do it enough, you know, then you'll yeah. get there. And we're like, Visualize it, yeah. Because now we blame ourselves because the crappy advice we're getting doesn't work, right? And yeah. that makes us feel worse about ourselves. So then we go from there off the page. So, so for me, it's about how do we do something that reliably moves the needle? Yes. Yep. And so it must move the needle. And if it can, it must move the needle in big chunks. So that's possible. But whatever's going on, it must move the needle. So now it's just a matter of reps. Mm. So maybe you need 10 or 15 or 20 reps. And if it's a small emotional investment, a small time investment, to do 15 or 10 reps, you know, to change your life. I mean, what a great bargain. And, and I think this is what affirmations kind of promised. Affirmations promised if I just say things to myself enough times, yeah. Yeah. I'll get there. And unfortunately, affirmations hardly ever delivers that promise. I think it's, it's the easiest technique to, le- to learn, but one of the weakest techniques out there. And so how can I borrow from what makes affirmations easy? It's simple. Mm. It's a concept of replication and also you're going to move the dial over time. So scanning and some of the other things I've developed is the same principles. How do we always move the needle? Yeah. How do we move the needle in as big chunks as possible? And how do we make it as simple as possible that you can do it yourself without having to engage with the professional like me? And yeah. this is for very, very heavy lifting. And if so, that's always easier to have someone else on the outside. Yeah. But for many things, in fact, most things you don't need someone on the outside if it's a growth uh, journey. Yeah. Some of the, uh, as, as you're talking and it's uh, because, of, you know, because I've struggled with a lot of this stuff, as you're talking, I can, I can hear some of the, the things that, you know, that go on in my head. One is, um, it sounds like, you know, when you talk about your beliefs, like, you know, I'm enough and, you know, belong and all that. Um, it, sound, it sounds almost like it's intended for someone who's, you know, really broken not me, you know, I'm, I'm kind of okay. Like I'm fine. I have some challenges and struggles, but that's not me. You know, if, if someone says like, do you belong and are you, are you okay? You're like, yeah, I'm fine. So I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, the sort of the, the non extreme process of being really okay and being really broken because a lot of people I speak to are like, no, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. It's not like I'm a, a complete emotional wreck on a daily basis. So I wouldn't say that I fall into the category of, yeah. of someone who might need to, to read this. Um, but there's, there's, there's ranges of how, how these things impact you. And I think the, the first thing is when, when you say, for example, um, you know, can you say I am enough? Uh, the first thing that pops into my head is like define enough. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing I've like, in what context are we talking here? So, you know, and, and that's it. Like the moment that your brain or the moment you have to, uh, you know, have some kind of condition on that or some kind of like, what do you mean by enough? Like I'm not actually able to say I'm good. I'm enough. Like what context? Cause at the moment I might be struggling with some work stuff, but I'm, you know, I'm okay at home. So I'm enough at home, but not quite at work because you know, I'm not getting things a hundred percent right. So, what what type of person would get value from reading your book that's that's not kind of sitting in a heap on the floor going you know i haven't left the house in six weeks and you know haven't showered and like haven't spoken to anyone and but yeah. let me just first read the definition of i'm enough so we can even test okay. it what kind of enough is i'm enough uh oh so uh oh the way i define it is i focus on and count what i am instead of what i am not i embrace all of my imperfections Okay, then <laughs> that's a whole other story. <laughs> so when we start to get a bit more granular, we can start to think, oh, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. on. Or, you know, if hang I get on. these rewards and this recognition, then yes, for sure. And, and so, so we can start to see what size the gap is. And the second thing is that we can be half-functioning people and, yes. and quite successful with even good relationships even. Yes. But there's always a cost and the cost is often hidden because it's so much part of our life we don't know any other way and the mm. cost as you spoke about earlier is often loss of energy agonizing worrying about what if 
you know, double, triple checking your work. Don't, you know, you don't want to put yourself out there in case you know, the rejection is too confound, too, too difficult to handle. Um, it's, it's holding yourself back. So, so I've started to kind of talk about the different categories, right? So if at the lowest level, if you're not enough and you've got some of the other beliefs that are missing, that category is, is what I call a masker. And a masker puts on a mask that they, that they don't want the world to see who they really are. And the mask is sometimes one of conformity, where you're saying yes when you have to say yes, where you're saying no. You tend to be the person in the office who does the most jobs and the most work and often gets the less appreciation, often gets taken for granted. And sometimes the mask is the mask of bravado of coolness. You know, yeah. you know my Instagram life is amazing, but yeah. I'm a puddle of mess, all the other stages where I'm not on camera. And so we, we, we spend a lot of energy behind the mask. And so that can be exhausting and crippling and eventually the mask will fall. And that can be a very devastating experience. One level up from that is the saboteur where, you know, you, you're doing well in life. You're kind of working well towards a job or an outcome or a career. And you've probably even got good relationships, but you find a way to mess it up. You find a way to put yourself at risk. You find your way to kind of reject people who really have their best interest at heart or to mess up a deadline or mess up a proposal where it doesn't make any logical sense that the pattern comes in again because deep down you don't believe you're worthy of that relationship, worthy of that success, worthy of that number, worthy of that title. And even with all the talents and potential in the world, somehow it just doesn't convert. And, and this saboteur thing is more common than you might think it's, it's something that people don't tend to talk about of course but you'll know it if you you know from a relationship point of view that's as the easiest to spot as you all the good or healthy relationships you reject because it's so boring <laughs> there's no there's something's missing yes the drama's missing that's why you, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and, you and we don't, kind of, that we don't notice until you take a few steps back and you look at the trends because it's not you don't consciously sabotage yourself, obviously. It's, it doesn't even, you know, it's not even a word that you'd think about. It's only when you really take a step back and go, let me think of the last three jobs I had. Let me take a look, think about the last three exams, the last five projects, the last 25 relationships, <laughs> you know, and, and like what happened and how did, you know, how did that all go wrong? Because I was actually quite happy or I actually kind of liked that. Or, and what is my part in all of that? Yeah, and, and, and I think it is, you know, one of the things we do want to do is go, oh, but it was them. You know, it was, yeah. it was, and I, you know, generally the, the common indicator is if you're constantly pointing at other people, there's probably a good chance that, you know, the common denominator is sitting here. You know? <laughs> the yeah, other place we often sabotage is our health and our fitness and our wellness. Where, yeah. you know, diet is a great saboteur platform of how you can do all the right things and mess it up with binge eating and then feel like a failure. Yeah. Um, so that's a kind of the second category. Yeah, of what we saboteur, yeah. The third category, and this is something that's, that uh, is also common, is what I call the big fish category where we don't want to take risk. We get used to getting acknowledgements, esteem, value, reputation from things we're good at. So we're really good at one system and work yeah. changes systems and we don't want to go to the other. We're really good at one niche and the niche needs to be updated or expanded and we cling to that. Mm. We're really good in a small pond where we're the big dog, the big cheese, the, the most important X or the most valuable Y. And the opportunity comes to kind of spread our wings to start as a beginner again somewhere and we don't want to do that and we reject it. We make very logical reasons about why no, it's not the right choice for me, you know, who wants to live in Cape Town? That place doesn't sound that great. Whatever we say, we, we tell a story that, that we kind of really try to buy into enough that we can actually yeah. sell it to ourselves. But the essence of the big fish is that they, they like to be the big dog in the small pond and don't want to step up in that space and feel like a beginner again because it's like you, you feel like you're stepping away from your value. Yeah. Then there's a fourth category called the seeker. And the seeker is the personal development junkie. They've been on courses, read books, gone to coaches, gone to therapists, and, and I think all those behaviors itself are healthy if it's relevant, if it's, if it's necessary for you. But what the difference is this, the seeker hopes the next course is going to bring them happiness, hopes the next book, the next guru is going to be the one that changes something inside of themselves that's going to change everything. Whereas opposed to the healthy version of this is that I'm increasingly in charge of my own happiness, increasingly in charge of my own sense of self-mastery, life mastery. And I do go to coaches, therapists, courses to kind of update but I know they're not going to deliver something for me that's actually should be internalized. That I'm in charge of how I feel about my world, my life. And the ultimate expert on me is not some guru, not some YouTube video. It's actually me. Yeah. And all those other people's purpose is to help me understand myself better rather than take their worldview and overlay it on top of how I think. So, so they're not experts on, on my world. They help me 
improve my expertise in my world. And, and that distinction sounds quite subtle, but it's mm. very, very healthy and important. Mm. So now along that scale, we've got all sorts of different readers and listeners who are maybe they're big fish in their relationship because they're still with their school, high school sweetheart, even though you've drifted apart and grown apart for whatever reason. So you're not re-engaging the relationship and you're not leaving the relationship because it's comfortable. Yeah. You know, maybe you're a saboteur in your studies, cramming, leaving things to the last moment, hoping that this time it's really going to work out where last yeah. time you got sick and last time you just screwed yeah. something. And surely this time is going to be different or oh, I've worked so well so far, you know, what do you expect from me? Mm. Maybe they're a masker in their university or even work studies environment where they don't show they really are. They can't speak up. They can't say yes when they want to say yes or no when they want to say no. Or perhaps even they're a seeker in terms of how they engage them, their brain or their mind outside of work. You know, they're always looking to find something to distract them rather than to find something to enhance them. So, so those kind of categories are pretty universal and very successful, very mature, very dynamic people are sitting across all levels yeah. of the continuum based on different contexts of their lives. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really, I really like that. And I think um, somehow these types of issues are issues that people don't really want to admit or think about. Or, or deal with, or, uh, or in a lot of cases, I find people actually are just not aware of how these things impact them on a daily basis. Yeah. You know, so yeah, sure, Yvonne, I struggle a little bit with anxiety, but so what? It's not, you know, it's really not, really not an issue. Um, and understanding my journey and understanding the journey of, you know, so many of the students that I work with and the young professionals I work with, um, understanding how that belief that you talk about you know i'm enough that simple statement that how does that impact today you know how does that impact today and um if you are you know like uh part of the definition that you said is or the statement is you know define myself based on what i am not what i'm not um for most people that i know and definitely for me if you say you know tell me about stuff the first thing i'll tell you is what i'm not good at you know i'm not doing this right and i can't get that right and you know that's the first thing that pops into my head is the stuff that i uh, you know haven't done this can't do that not good at that not great at that uh, that's just an instinctive habitual you know that that is but and i think most people are probably on a similar phase especially if you're studying and you're continually you know or you're on a qualification journey where you continually are being assessed because that's a very different experience as well you know any qualification journey you're continually being assessed so you continually have someone telling you you're not good enough you don't know enough yet you still have more to learn and there's still more to learn and the you know the learning curve is really really high um so um i think understanding that that belief or not having that solid belief impacts the decisions you make today it impacts you know right from what you decide to eat <laughs> like you say you know the diet what you decide to eat looking for comfort food uh you know not doing that project and procrastinating because you're just too scared to start it not doing the studying because you kind of are like i just can't face it right now i don't have the mental energy for it uh, spending time in your head worrying about what so-and-so next to you thinks about you instead of getting on with, you know, with, with the next project. Um, so what advice do you, do you have for people who are kind of going, I'm not sure if that actually impacts me or I'm not really sure that I need to do something about that? So it's a bit of theory around how emotions work. So the model that I come from neurosemantics is that our emotions is the automatic response our mind gives us when it compares what we believe versus what we get. So we've got a world, a yeah. world map of how we see the world, how things should be. And every day, the map of the world interacts with the world how it actually is. And that difference is, our, is the feedback we get in the form of emotion. And then we kind of classify and judge that emotion. So, for example, you might have an expectation that when you were in the workplace, your boss should greet you. And now they don't, and now you feel affronted or offended or upset. You should have, you might have an assumption that when you're studying, you know, all your notes should make sense, and there should be a logical progression how you get them. And now you, they arrive. <laughs> it's not that at all. And that okay. difference is frustration, irritation. You might have the assumption that I'm going into a meeting, and and um, they're going to expect me to be 
perfect to be a genius. Yeah. And now you feel in that meeting that you're not perfect or not a genius and that feeling that emotions, anxiety and stress and fear. So, so one of the first things you can start to do is you audit your emotions. So, so when you're feeling something, first question, what am I feeling? What am I experiencing? You might have to wait around, especially if you've been in your head for many years, but you'll get some information eventually. And the second thing is, so, so what's this about? What is this? Yeah. And this part is the emotion. So what is this fear about? What is this anxiety about? What is this worry about? What is this concern about? What yeah. is this hesitation about? What is this procrastination yeah. about? Yeah. And if you keep on tracking, firstly, what emotions you're feeling on a regular basis, and two, what is behind the emotion, that's the, the kind of the edge of the belief. It's the edge of the mindset that's starting to create it. So there might be multiple beliefs mm. that roll up into that emotion. But just to understand what's going on, what's the kind of presenting belief, yeah. We'll start to give you some clues around what you're experiencing. So any any anxiety, fear, worry, concern, anything that drains energy mm. is normally based on belief that's fear-based. Yeah, yeah. So now we can start to look at what kind of fear-based beliefs do you have, and we all do in shapes and forms. Yeah. But once you start to look at that and you think, oof, you know, what am I not, what might I be leaving about myself that I have these fear-based beliefs? Yeah. And then you'll start to realize how these things like believing that you're enough, that you matter, that you do belong, that you are, you do accept yourself fully, not having those are leaking into your world. Right? Yeah. So what you believe about yourself affects everything you do. So it leaks. Yeah. It comes yeah. out. It's like, you know, I always think about the fridge. I don't have to see the fridge to know it's running, right? So <laughs> I walk around the corner, open it up, and everything is nice and frosty on the inside. And the same with your beliefs. You don't have to name them to know they're still running. They're still, the fridge in your mind is still going, humming along. But unfortunately, many of those beliefs that you've got are out of date, unhealthy, unuseful, and sometimes just plain crappy. And so having some sort of a process to be able to audit them, have a look what's going on, and update them to something healthy is kind of yeah. what Essence of the Game Changer Protocol is all about. Yeah. One of the things that I really liked about um, our, uh, our sessions as well and, and you know, the, the stuff you discuss is, and you've just mentioned it now again is is that is updating you know updating those beliefs and updating the stuff that you think um and it definitely was something that that i struggled with again completely unconsciously is somewhere in your head you still operate like you're 15 years old or 20 years old or, or whatever um you know, whatever that stage in life is. And in a lot of cases, it's something that, you know, may, may have been like a traumatic incident or something that locks you at that age. And your brain didn't get the memo that you're not that person anymore. <laughs> yes, it's connected. You know, yeah. and this is something that I, I say to my students so much is they're so terrified of failure, but they've failed quite a lot of things. And failure is apocalyptic to them, like can't cope. And I'm like, well, actually, you're really good at failure. You know, you you keep coming back and you've registered again and you're still studying and you still have hope and you're still doing this and you're still trying. Um, so you're acing failure, you know, like you're, you're really, you're getting a distinction in how to deal with failure. So, but your, your brain is still so terrified of it and your brain is still going, I'm so scared. What if we fail? It's going to be the end of the world, black hole, disaster, apocalypse, world's going to fall apart. And yet you've failed quite a few things and you've come through it and you're still there and you're still hoping and you're still trying and you're still done. So there's a disconnect, you know, that between the reality of what you do on a daily basis and who you are and some of your old thought process that you're still hanging on to. And I really like that, you know, part of your process and part of your stuff is going, do you, you know, like we need to update our thinking on, on where we are. Does it still match? Is it still the same fear? Is it still who we are? Is it still who we should be? Is it, you know, um, is it where we want to be? You know, as you say, like be your best, but also be, be better than, you know, who you are today. The, the, the other interesting thing that I didn't really realize, and I know you, you bring it up in your book as well, is paying more attention to the, your physical feelings, paying yes. more attention to what's actually happening in your body and the awareness that your emotions are impacting your actual physical, it's not just in your head, it's, it's impacting your physical self. Do, do you want to have a bit of a chat about that? Because I don't think it's something that a lot of people are really aware of. And I know so, you do deal with it in the book. So if I had to ask you to point towards your mind, where would you point? And, and most of us would point at our kind of brain or head area, right? But then 
we get gut feelings and our heart speaks to us and we feel pressure on our shoulders and we feel betrayed by being stabbed in the back and we get restless you know, in terms of our energy. So we've got all these idioms and metaphors that talks about the mind communicating through other parts of the body than our brain or our head. And there's even some science around how many neurotransmitters there are in the heart and in the gut. And there's, there actually are, that the new thinking talks about the three brains of the body. Yes, yes. And I'm taking it one step further where I'm borrowing Candice Pert's phrase where she said, the whole of the body is the unconscious mind. So, so if that's true, if the whole of our body is our conscious mind, which means our mind can speak to us from anywhere in our body. Yeah. So when we get okay. hands or we get tension in the throat, you know, a frog in the throat when we can't speak is a good example. we get that feeling in our stomach. So we tend to recognize, oh, I'm getting a gut feeling about this, but we don't interrogate. So by focusing on body sensations as they emerge, especially if they're spontaneous based on what's going on right in front of you, that's your mind trying to speak to you through your body. And you can start to work with it. You can say, focus on the energy. What's that about? Wait, wait, wait. It's normally a slow answer and sometimes a minute or longer. And you'll get just a hint of something. And, mm. and what you get there is, is like a message from your body, a message from your mind through your body. And, and in the book, I talk about it. But very simply, there's two choices or three, depends on which model you're using. But first one, it's a good message. It's something that you want to keep. So you're... You're feeling tension in your stomach. What's it about? Oh, this is a really important presentation. My body's getting ready for me to perform. Okay, great. So if it's a good thing, you thank the message and what you'll feel is the energy will start to disperse because it's engaged, it's acknowledged. Mm -hmm. But most often the thing that will happen is you'll get something and it'll be a negative. It'll be an old belief, an old thinking, an old fear, something that's trapped or hidden or blocked. And that's something that you've got to get rid of. So for example, if we had the same uh, feedback in the stomach, or let's use it like a, you've got a frog in the throat, you're about yeah, to tightening. The tightening there. This just gets mm. a bit tense. You focus on that while you're feeling it. What's it about? What's it about? And wait, wait, wait. You might get a, something like, can't mess this up if I do, this is my only chance. Well, something, if you think about living with that belief, mm. I'm sure it would create tension or that kind of understanding. Mm. I'm sure it will create some tension. So, when you find a negative, there's this one phrase that you can use again and again and again. And I really encourage you guys to try it out once you find a negative. And the phrase is this. I give myself full permission to let go of as much of this as I can right mm. now. I give mm. myself full permission to let go of as much of this as I can right now. And what that does is even if it's a big, heavy, overwhelming fear, anxiety, you're chipping away at it. So, so let's say it's like this much anxiety Right now, you can only chop off that much, but then you've loaded a little bit. Yeah. And now, later on that day, the next day, you find the same thing. You chip away at it again, chip away, chip away. And eventually, what you do is you can knock it over. I just don't know how many swings of the action you need to have. depends on Because maybe you're in a good space and you can knock it all over. Yeah. I don't know. It's how yeah. the mind's working on that day. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't matter if each time you chip away at it. So it might take one chip, 50 chips, 20 chips. Who cares? As long as you're making progress. And once you reduce the negative, the existing mindset, and hopefully it's a more positive mindset, normally is, will start to become more dominant again. will start to be more of a guiding force. So like your mindset that this is an important conversation, I respect this other person, I respect this opportunity, yeah. Yeah. that should lead my fluency. And I have this old fear from when I was in school and I had to speak in front of everyone and they mocked me and, they, and this 12-year-old or 14-year-old fear is sitting yeah. here, even though I'm an you know, adult and I'm a grown-ass person, this thing is still out of date over here. Yeah. And so Wait, and as I make it weaker, eventually the existing mindset will take over. Yeah. And so okay. when the existing mindset is really poor, that's when you do need the game changer work to be able to get, okay, I'm enough, I belong, yeah. I have what it takes. And then you get rid of the anxiety, which is a product from not believing that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Get rid of the anxiety and change the mindset. And when you put both together, then you are literally a new person. Then you are literally more of how you are born to be, more of how you you created. But just for whatever reason, you had some life experiences that knocked these really crappy beliefs into you. And now we've got the tools finally to get rid of them. And so you yeah. can actually get into the value the way you were created. Um, it's, not as, it's not as easy as it seems. Um, although the tool's really simple because we're not used to interrogating how we feel in that moment, you know, and we're not actually used to stepping back and looking at ourselves from a distance and going, what's really going on here. So I know for, for me, it's something I struggled with because there's, there's a hundred filters between 
you know, sitting, sitting with, you know, sitting with that and saying, okay, I'm, you know, I'm completely open to trying this technique, but you're, you're never completely open to trying a technique because you're worried about whether or not it will work, you know, uh, you know, like, am I going to be able to do this? <laughs> is, is it going to work? Uh, is this, you know, the cynicism pops in, there's all these, and you're just, you're not used to sort of saying so, you know, analyzing and, and part of that is like, you know, what's tightening or what's happening in your body right now. We're not used to doing that. So it actually, I just want to, just want to sort of put that out there and say, it, it takes time if you've never done that. It takes time for you to identify what's going on physically and where it comes from. It's not an instant thing because it's not something, you know, it's not yeah. something that you've ever really done before. Uh, you know, what I've done with my online course of Game Changer was to actually have videos of me coaching other people and, and me also right. self-coaching. So when you start to unpack it at multiple levels, you take away some of the anxiety about how does this technique work? Am I doing it right? What's happening right now for me yeah. that I, it's not, I'm not where I expect it to be? I'm not getting this uh, wrong. <laughs> and it's, a bit of a, it's a nice growing community of people who are on the course and communicating right. and talking about their experiences. So it's nice that as becomes more common there's more shared experience and becomes easier for people to go on that journey but you're right it's about not having judgment yeah it's about and a bit of patience go as much judgment as you can uh, and, and giving it a go right you you mentioned uh you mentioned your online course we were, was going wanted to chat about that so so tell me a bit more about it how closely is it related to your to your book i mean is it the case of like if you want value you know either get the book all the course or are they do they have slightly different focuses so so right now on amazon it's kind of the easiest way to get the book is that's the original 10 beliefs and it's got the the major scan which i call the advanced scan which is about coaching the different variations in the mind so right. so instead of having two options keep and let go you've got now three options so there's a little bit more of intellectual work that's needed to be done to get used to it the online course is both that scan and the beginning scan, which I call the core scan, which is a lot easier to learn as a beginner. Okay. You're also able to watch demos and, and get notes and right. get all the descriptions right. and PDFs and whatnot. And also there's a community of people who are sharing their experiences about what's actually going on for them, what parts resonate, what questions they have about technique and, and what's working, what's not working. So you become part of the community to be able to engage and be able to engage me because I'm on the forums, I'm answering right. those questions, I'm answering those those requests, uh, kind of trying to create a better body of knowledge for the people out there using the technique. Yeah. So those are probably the, the major differences. So also, I'm gonna sorry, put, sorry another, yeah. another difference. Um, there's now 13 beliefs, not just 10. Okay. Uh, You're uh, at it. <laughs> three more. Three more. You're going to have to update your book. You're going to have to write a new book. Yes. <laughs> Game changer too. Uh, so I'm going to put links to your book and to your online course uh, in, in, in whatever article or, or wherever I post this video. So I will, I will put links so people can find it and they don't have to, they don't have to chase you down. Um, and I, I, I want to thank you for, for, for your time. And I'm really hoping that at the very least, someone who's, who's sort of watched this discussion will start thinking about how their emotions and how their mindset impacts them uh, and in a little bit more of an awareness of how important it is as opposed to, I must just feel better, like you say, like I must just feel better, like just be positive. It was something that I've always struggled with is people telling me I must just be positive, you know. Um, and I don't know how to be positive. <laughs> I don't know. It's like if I if, if you could just be positive, then I would. You know, it's not a it's not a button. I, so you know, and, and you you mentioned that earlier, and I think uh, there's so many people that are and so many students and so many people that I interact with that are struggling with the same things. Is like, how do I just be something else? Like, how do I just get there? So I really, you know, I, I really hope that you know the people watching this and 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 that will will take a look at your stuff hunt you down, um, maybe even somewhere along the line meet, meets up with you and, and, and whatever. But the fact that you can help add value to them through the book and, and the online course, I, I appreciate. Um, and yeah, I sincerely hope that, that, uh, that they have a bit of a better understanding of how their thoughts and mindsets and emotions impact their lives 
regardless of where you are. You don't need to be a CEO to need performance coaching. Kind of. Absolutely. So, so thank you for the opportunity to share with you. I think the last kind of picture is that to go on this journey of studying, uh, you know, I imagine your students are all like kind of Ferraris or your favorite sports cars and something glamorous and this kind of unbelievable potential to be able to do crazy and cool things. And, and the studies are going to be all about the accelerator. Like you, you learn how to do more and more things with, with your skill set, more and more skill, more and more things in terms of adding value and contributing. But the stuff that I focus on and we focus on is the mindset, the emotions, the, the space between. And unfortunately, yeah. that's more the handbrake. That, you know, if you don't let down the handbrake, if you don't get out of your own way, it does not matter how much mm-hmm. you accelerate. You're just in a burning rubber. True. And I think a lot of people think that. I think they, they think if I just accelerate more, this will go away. That's a good word. Handbrake tends to accelerate the same way yeah. at the same yeah. time. Yeah. You kind of get tighter and tighter and tighter as you accelerate more and more and more until something happens. So I, I really like that. The, the technical work and the stuff that you think is the hard stuff because it's all these impressive calculations and theory and knowledge is, is, is the accelerator. But if you've got the handbrake on because of all this other stuff going on in the background, then... Yeah, it's you know you, you're you're not going anywhere. So I really that's a that's a good thought. That's a good thought to be with. Um, and then just 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 before we say goodbye, if you can just repeat uh, if you can just repeat the the definition or the 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 statement relating to the I am enough statement, because um, I think that is something that we need to we need to give a little bit more thought to in terms of how we feel about it. So the definition of I am enough and game changer protocol is. I focus on and count what I am instead of what I am not. I embrace all my imperfections. <clears throat> Such a simple little sentence. <laughs> Easy to say, hard to do. Yeah, very much. It would be very, yeah, it would be very interesting. And I think the more you know, wherever wherever I put this this platform up, it would be it would be really good to get feedback and comments from from people how they feel about it. And as you say, the bigger the community is of people going, yes, actually, I do kind of struggle with that. Whether, you know, you're right on this side of the radar, close to the end or whatever, everyone's somewhere in between. But let's be more open about the fact that all of us are struggling with, you know, with, with that to some extent or the other in different phases of our life. So thank you very, very much for your time. I really, I really appreciate it. And as I said, I'll put links to all of your bits and pieces and all of your stuff in in, in the descriptions and in the, in the content. And um, yeah, hopefully we, we, shall see, we shall see more of you and more books and more online courses. Thank you.